good evening and welcome to the first scientific evening of the academic year 2014-2015. It is our uh, great, a great pleasure and honor to have with us tonight Professor Peter Yeni, I can say from CERN, uh, who is a world-renowned experimental particle physicist and uh, he studied in Switzerland at the University of Bern and he obtained his PhD at uh, ETH in Zurich. Uh, his career started with the participation at CERN experiments in the synchrocyclotron and proton synchrotron. Uh, and I think also at the first Hadron Collider, which was named Intersecting Storage Rings. <clears throat> At late 70s, he moved uh, to Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in the United States and uh, became a member of the Mark II collaboration at the Electron Positron Storage Ring Spear. <clears throat> his work, and also the work of his collaborators, resulted in the first measurement of two photon widths of the eta prime particle which was uh, giving a further evidence and support to the quark model, which was at that time not obvious. <clears throat> uh, I think that already uh, during his stay in the United States, he gained strong interest in physics and instrumentation of future colliders, and in particular for the Large Hadron Collider, which was at that time a project and idea to be built uh, at CERN. In the 90s, his activities concentrated on tasks related to a new collaboration at the LHC. Uh, the LHC is a collider which surpassed all previous experiments in the field for an order of magnitude. After formal approval of the ATLAS project, Professor Yeni was elected spokesperson of the experiment, which is the ATLAS experiment today comprises some 3,000, more than 3,000 scientists representing 177 institutions from 38 countries. <clears throat> he was re-elected spokesperson of Atlas experiments, I don't know, several times. I don't know exactly how, how many. <clears throat> uh, but in February 2009, he became a guest scientist at CERN and the honorary professor at the Albert Ludwigs Universität in Freiburg in Germany. Of course, as he told me today, he retained a strong involvement in ATLAS, in ATLAS operation and in ATLAS physics activities. <clears throat> uh, during his career, Professor Yeni co-authored over 450 scientific uh, papers and holds an H index of 92. He received a number of international awards, awards, among others, Swiss Greinacher Prize, Slovak Gold Medal of the Comenius University in Bratislava, Czech Charles University in Prague, Memorial Civil Medal, <coughs> Czech Academy of Sciences, Ernst Mach Honorary Medal, Julius Wess Prize from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, uh, European Physical Society for High Energy, uh, sorry, High Energy Physics Prize, and in 2014 he has been elected as corresponding member of the Bavarian Academy of Science. For those of you who don't know, <coughs> Professor Peter Yeni will receive a do uh, honorary doctor degree from the University of Nova Gorica at the tomorrow evening uh, ceremony. <coughs> Tonight, he will give a talk entitled The Long Journey to the Higgs Boson and Beyond at the LHC. Please, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Danilo, for this uh, warm introduction. Of course, you have exaggerated on many things, but... So, I'm really very pleased to be here in uh, Slovenia again. I have uh, quite a few friends here and come from time to time. And uh, this is, however, the first time here in Vipava. So I'm very pleased to tell you the story 
about the long journey, really, to the Higgs boson, and also hinting what could be uh, beyond uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson at the LHC. So let me start by just uh, giving one key message, namely that the LHC project is really a very large global scientific adventure which combines a collider, an accelerator, which uh, needs needed really very big advance in worldwide computing and of course which uh, consists of uh, quite impressive instruments, the experiments. And uh, for me, this is really a great pleasure now to show you some first results because <clears throat> this uh, project started some uh, 30 years ago. So I think quite a few uh, of you here in the audience, you were still virtual at that time, not yet born. So let me step back and tell you a little bit what we are uh, doing actually in particle physics and in a way we are connecting the very large in the universe dimensions 10 to the 28 centimeter to the very small inside the uh, atomic nuclei inside the proton and the neutron the human scale is on this nonlinear uh, scale just conveniently in the middle and as I said in a way <clears throat> the physics we are doing this fundamental physics connects what we try to observe and measure in space with space-borne telescopes or uh, telescopes on the earth with looking at the smallest constituents of matters and uh, studying uh, their interactions. And one can actually view the LHC as a super microscope where we're looking what is really happening in the interactions with <coughs> elementary particles and thereby one really makes a synergy between uh, particle physics and with astronomy cosmology. The goal of particle physics is to answer basically two questions, namely what are the elementary constituents of matter and what are really the forces which uh, are responsible for interactions between them. And the way we do that is uh, using particle accelerators uh, to collide uh, particles, as I will explain in a few minutes. Let me just uh, introduce <coughs> the units and also to recall you that uh, we are basing, in a way, our investigations on one simple uh, formula, which everybody knows, the equivalence between the energy and mass. And so what we do in our particle accelerators is having a lot of energy. We produce eventually massive states, like for example the Higgs boson, which in turn then decays again into lighter particles which we observe. And the energy scale which we will be talking about is typically the uh, tera electron volt means about a thousand times the uh, mass of the familiar proton. We can also <coughs> vision this synergy between studying the cosmos and uh, particle physics, uh, taking this sketch here, which has on a very nonlinear scale the history of our universe from the Big Bang to today, something like 14 uh, billion years. And what we actually 
study in uh, collider like the LHC is the elementary physics which happened something like 10 to the minus 10 seconds or so after the Big Bang. Of course, we can try to study that by observing, uh, making observations in the universe. However, what we do at uh, the Large Hadron Collider, we reproduce elementary collisions corresponding to this state. And uh, we can do this in very well-defined uh, conditions and we can repeat experiments. This is a very basic uh, property of uh, doing this type of science. So let me show you right away in this uh, little animation here what we are actually doing. I will show you here a picture of the accelerator. This is a ring of 27 kilometers between the French and the Swiss uh, border. We accelerate protons, which consist of uh, quarks and gluons, and we bring these uh, particles into collision in detectors. I will say more about that, where we uh, produce many secondary particles, which we then investigate, and uh, that's the way we study uh, these interactions and these particles. I also want to briefly introduce to you what we call the uh, standard model of particle physics, because these will be terms which I will be using during my talk. In fact, the standard model of particle physics is a very simple conceptually theory, which uh, has on one hand, the constituents of matters, which are called quarks and leptons. They are three families. This is the first family, second family, third family. Then there are the interactions, and you all know there are four uh, interactions which we know between particles. The electromagnetic force, the strong force, which binds, for example, the quarks, uh, together into a proton or a neutron. Then there is the weak force, which is responsible for radioactive decays. And then there is also a force force, the gravitation, which is maybe the most uh, uh, familiar uh, to us. Now, the standard model of uh, particle physics actually talks about uh, these families, matter particles, the forces, with their force carriers. And uh, it has what is called field series for these three interactions. Gravitation is not yet included in this uh, standard model. But yet, there was still a, an element missing, and I will say more about that, which is the question why do actually these particles have masses and also very different masses? And that is the famous uh, Higgs field, which uh, will come into action here. Again, I will talk more about that. Indeed, the, uh, this missing element of, uh, of the standard model, namely what gives particle a mass and what gives them, for example, very different masses compared to the up quarks or the top quarks, the heaviest one, well, a theory was put forward 50 years ago, independently by Peter Higgs, and also by Braut and Englert, and uh, three other uh, physicists. And to verify this theory was a driving motivation for particle accelerators over many uh, decades. And in fact, uh, this was maybe the, the strongest motivation to build, actually, the LHC. Let me once more show you the uh, three families of the matter particles, now in a somewhat more <coughs> systematic way. They have one property. They have a spin 
one can imagine that as a, something like a kick to uh, a spin in that sense, which is half integer. They are called fermions. Then the particles which are responsible for the interactions, namely the gluons, the photon for the electromagnetic, Z and W bosons for the weak force, they have this quantity, the spin being one, and uh, integer, and are called bosons. And there is one, was one hypothetical particle which has a very special property, namely a spin zero. That means it has no uh, preferred direction and so on. So these were the are terms which we will be using during the talk uh, throughout. Now, just to remind you, of course, uh, this bold theory was actually verified, and I will show you the evidence for this verification uh, in uh, summer 2012. And then last year, uh, this resulted in the Nobel Prize for Francois Englert and Peter Hicks, and uh, this is the citation the noble citation and being experimentalists, we are of course very proud that uh, it was clearly noted by the Nobel Committee that this uh, prize could be given because the theory was confirmed through the particle which was found by the Atlas and CMS experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. The standard model of uh, particle physics can be described in a mathematical framework, and of course I show this only that this exists, I will not talk about that. Maybe here just a nice picture of Francois Englert pointing out the term which is uh, introduced in this theory to describe actually the, uh, mass, the masses of the particle. Uh, what is called here the Higgs dynamics and mass term. You may ask, why, why are you bothered about uh, a Higgs particle? Why, why do we need actually a Higgs particle? Well, let me try to give you one uh, simple explanation for that. Well, the elementary particles, they are all point-like, and therefore, the natural consequence would be that they should have no mass. They should be massless. But uh, experimentally, we know that this is not the case because some of these particles, like the W or Z bosons, they are very heavy. Others, indeed, the photon or the gluons, they are massless. So this, there must be something at play which breaks the symmetry, that some have a mass, some don't have a mass. And uh, that's the reason why this theory actually is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Again, I cannot really go into more detail. Eventually in the discussion we can come to that. But just to say, the idea which was put forward by this gentleman 50 years ago is that uh, all the space is filled by a field with which every particle interacts with some, they in, some of these particles interact stronger, these are the heavy particles, other interact less, these are the light particles. And the consequent, there are several consequences of this field, but one major one is that there should be an excitation, so to speak, of this field, if you have enough energy, which produces a massive scalar particle. Scalar because it has a spin zero, but the theory did not predict how heavy it would be. But clearly, if one would discover this particle, then that would be we could go backwards and say we have actually really uh, proven that it's, this exists. So that's the whole point about it. So I will leave you the transparency at the end, and there is a very nice comic strip 
where all this uh, is explained in a, in a funny way, but I think quite correct way. Let me make a last uh, point in this introductory remarks. Actually, <coughs> the Higgs field or the Higgs particle has only to do with a very, very small part of the masses. So for me, it's only about less than 800 grams. It's less than 1% of the masses are actually in the masses of the elementary particles. The rest is in the binding energy. For example, we know that the proton consists of three quarks, which are held together with, uh, with gluons. And uh, this binding energy, again, using the Einstein formula, uh, corresponds and makes actually 99% of the mass. OK, that is the theoretical introduction. Now I want to say a few words about uh, CERN, where we have built the accelerator to test experimentally whether all this makes sense or not. So CERN is an organization which has been uh, uh, founded some 60 years ago. In fact, we just had the 60th anniversary. It has today 21 member states. Here they are listed. And uh, there are quite a few uh, other countries which are candidate to become a member state. Among them, uh, also Slovenia, and I hope this uh, will soon happen. Uh, CERN is a big, uh, a big laboratory. You can see it has something like 2,500 staff almost, and a budget typically of uh, 1 billion Swiss francs. However, uh, CERN is not a laboratory where just physicists are uh, employed by CERN and doing the physics. It's a laboratory which, in a way, belongs to a whole world community. Many physicists from all over the world use the CERN facilities. And as you can see, in fact, there are something like more than 10,000 uh, scientists using the CERN facility coming from member states, they are shown here in blue, from observer states, and uh, countries also from other regions. Now, <clears throat> maybe a little bit more about the, the history, how was uh, actually CERN uh, founded, how it came it about? Well, the first ideas <clears throat> about uh, making a very high energy hadron collider were put forward already in the early 80s. But in the very beginning, one was afraid that colliding protons together, uh, one would not really collide elementary particles because the elementary particles are uh, the quarks and gluons inside. And there were, one was afraid one could not really do discovery physics with a machine which would produce a lot of uh, debris which are a background. However, then in 1982-83, there was already a Hadron Collider at CERN which uh, brought the discoveries of the W and C boson. And this is a signature from a C boson which <clears throat> decays into an electron and a positron. This is actually the energy deposited uh, in a calorimeter, and uh, the phi is 180 degrees. Uh, so that means it's a particle was produced, which then decayed in an electron and a positron. And this can be very, could be seen very easily. So that immediately triggered the physicist community that uh, saying, well, we can actually make discoveries, so let's build a much bigger machine. This was in 1984 that uh, 
this community came together for the first time, together with uh, machine builders and theorists, of course, also. Uh, this famous uh, Lausanne workshop. And then uh, it took almost 10 years, really, to make these ideas more concrete. And in fact, the ideas became very concrete 1992, when uh, the ATLAS and the CMS experiments, these experiments which found now a few couple of years ago the Higgs particle, uh, were formed. And indeed, we just celebrated uh, two years ago with uh, the spokesperson at that time of ATLAS, the 20th anniversary, actually, of uh, the foundation of ATLAS and similarly from the CMS experiment. Now, this was the wish of the physicists in building the, the experiments. Of course, you also need a collider. And for that, one had to convince the CERN Council to build this machine, and that was also a very long process. Again, I don't, will not go into detail, but just to tell you that actually the first time the Council took note that one should build such a machine was in 1991. And uh, then at the end of 94, a uh, preliminary version of the machine was approved. The member counties agreed to finance it. But uh, it took then another uh, few years until the end of 1996 that uh, really all the finances to build the machine were brought together, and it was 1996 that the LHC, uh, of which I will uh, show you then the result, uh, has been really approved. But as you can see, uh, in addition to the European countries, many non-member uh, states were also contributing components to this machine. A few words about the LHC. The LHC is housed in a tunnel about 100 meters underground. These are 27 kilometers. And what is the LHC? What is a particle a collider? Here are a few uh, elements for it. Well, you need dipole magnets to keep the particles going around on this racetrack. You need quadrupole magnets to keep the particles together so that they stay together, that at the end you can bring them into collision. You need some places where you can accelerate the particles. They are called radio frequency cavities. And then you need the experiments. Uh, you need a few more elements, like disposing the beam when you are finished with the experiment, collimating, and so on. And of course, you need a brain to orchestrate all this. In practice, how does it look like? Well, there are the heart of the machine are dipole magnets. They are about 15 meters long. And here there are two beam pipes where the particles go in one pipe this way, in the other way the other way, about 25 centimeters apart. In order to have very high energy particles, you need very strong magnets to guide them around. And to get strong magnets, you need superconducting technology. In fact, the uh, magnets are cooled down to 1.9 Kelvin, such that they are uh, superconducting. This is in the superfluid uh, uh, helium uh, phase. Then the magnets there just to keep the particles on track. You also need to accel sorry, you also need no. Why, why does it do this? Ah. Not what I want to do, sorry. Uh, I just want to show you how one ah, accelerates the particles well. In basically one generates an electromagnetic field such, well, excuse me, one, one generates 
an electromagnetic field such that every time when the particles go through, they get a little kick. In fact, they go 11,000 times per second, this 27 kilometers, so every time you give them a little kick, and so they get more and more energy. Now, that's how these uh, radio frequencies look like in uh, reality. They are also supraconducting. And uh, the final element is uh, that we need to focalize the beams uh, very strongly and bring them at some point into collision, namely there where we want to uh, study uh, their interactions. And uh, these are elements, for example, built here in Japan and in, uh, in the United States. Uh, you need furthermore a whole series of pre-accelerating machines where you inject then finally the beams into this LHC ring and you bring them in collision. Now, on this uh, animation, there were just two protons. Of course, it's not what you really do. You have uh, many protons. In fact, you have many packages of protons. And each package, bunch we call them, has something like 10 to the 11 uh, protons. So, you work with many, many collisions. Why do you need so many collisions? Well, because the interesting events, for example, a Higgs event, which we can uh, then detect in the experiment, happens only one in 10 to the 13 collisions. So clearly, uh, one needs highly sophisticated instruments to find these very rare events. And that was one of the big uh, challenges of the experiments. Let me say a few words about uh, the detectors. How do they look like? Well, this is the basic scheme. You have different layers around the interaction point. In the innermost part, you detect charged particles. Then you have what we call calorimeter, where we measure the energies, for example, of photons, electrons, pions, and outside on this sketch shown here in red, where we measure the only charged particle which goes through the massive material of calorimeters, the muons. So these detectors have first to select very quickly interesting candidates, this one out of 10 to the 13, but then also to measure the properties very uh, precisely. Um, when the LHC was conceived, the program, one wanted to not just ask the question whether the Higgs particle exists or not, but there were many open questions in the standard model, namely also, for example, what is the nature of the dark matter? Are there other interactions in addition to the four we mentioned and so on? And that led to a program of four big experiments, uh, in particular ATLAS and CMS, uh, on which we will concentrate now much more. And in a way, so far with the LHC, we have only touched upon the first of the question, namely, what is the origin of elementary particle masses? Just a quick uh, pictures of the two specialized experiment, one which is called LHCP because studying mainly the B quark, one is called ALICE, looking at the uh, quark gluon plasma questions, more nuclear physics question, and then there are the general purpose experiments, looking for the Higgs, looking for dark matter and so, ATLAS and CMS. Just a few uh, examples, photos from what this meant, actually, these experiments. This took about uh, almost 15 years to build them because they were really a huge uh, engineering challenge. Show you first a few things from the CMS experiment. This is, for example, their uh, solenoid magnet, 
which uh, gives the magnetic field of four Teslas. So this is the biggest solenoid superconducting solenoid ever built. You see here the size of people. This was built in the early 2000 and it was then tested in 2006, first time on the surface. Another component of uh, this CMS experiment were uh, crystals, namely 80,000, which uh, were produced again almost over 10 years uh, to measure with high precision the energy of electrons and photons. You will see later on why you want to measure them with uh, high precision. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the CMS experiment in 208, just before uh, this end cap was closed. Uh, you see here the vacuum pipe where the particles come from both sides. This is the end of this central cylinder, which I showed you in the sketch. So the collisions will be about here over there. Let me say something about the ATLAS experiment. The ATLAS experiment is, has been built by a very large collaboration. Danilo already mentioned some 3,000 scientists and also a lot of uh, young people on it. I will show it. And in fact, since a long time, we have a very fruitful collaboration with a Slovenian physicists uh, from the Josef Stefan Institute and the University of Ljubljana. And I just said, there are a lot of young people actually in this experiment. Uh, about one third of the 3,000 physicists, scientists working, they are working on their PhD. And uh, so it's really, your ex it could be your experiment. It's, it's uh, very nice to work on. Just to show you a picture. This is Atlas. Well, again, has this typical onion structure where all these different layers have uh, different functions to identify uh, the particles. To maybe give you two numbers only, it uh, has about 100 million channels, electronic channels, about 3,000 kilometers of cables to connect it to the electronics. And uh, this experiment is installed on the LHC, which, as I said, is about 100 meters here. It's 85 meters underground in a very huge cavern. These are the dimensions of the cavern. And just to show you a picture, during the construction of the cavern, this was in uh, early 2003. So this is the connection to the tunnel. This is the cavern where we then built up the experiment. This was in 2003, 2004, when the cavern was empty. And one of the first things we installed was a big magnetic system, a toroid. This took about one year to install. These are supraconducting magnet coils, eight of them, which make a field which goes like that, that's why it's called a toroid. And everybody has uh, probably seen in the media this picture, which was in 2005. Then in 2007, finally, uh, the magnet was uh, completed with the active detectors. For example, here, these are muon detectors. Uh, inside are tracking detectors. These are typical calorimeters. And uh, just to show you some examples of uh, the contributions from the Slovenian uh, colleagues. They were building parts of the inner detector, which is at the very center around the uh, interaction point. These are uh, still when they were put together on the surface, and then, of course, they were installed in the underground. As you can see, there were also very huge pieces which uh, have been built and then transported and put uh, to the experiment. So finally, in uh, 2008, after uh, more than 10 years of uh, construction, the experiment was essentially ready, and Peter Hicks was uh, visiting Atlas. Actually, for the first time, he came to look at uh, the LHC, and 
Peter Hicks is a very modest person. When he saw this, he said, really, my God, all this for our ideas, which we had some uh, 40 years ago or so. Now, when telling the story about the LHC, I have also to say that not everything always went as smooth as it should be, because in 2008, we would, at the end of 2008, we would have been ready to start in September. But uh, there was an incident happening, namely, it turned out that one of the connections in the, in the machine between superconductors was faulty uh, when powered an electric arc uh, developed which punctured this liquid helium line i told you the helium is at 1.9 degree and when it becomes then to room temperature it expands more than a factor of thousand or so so it was like an ex it was an explosion so a lot of mechanical damage happened and it took 15 months to repair a part of the machine. And then finally, in November 2009, we were ready. And uh, we see Marco Mikus was, was very worried. What's going on? But, 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 OK, uh, things went well this time. In fact, there was a great joy when the first uh, collision was really observed. You see here clear evidence that particle collided. That was just at uh, low energy. The high energy really happened then in uh, March 2010, when the beams were really accelerated to 3,500 GV. So there was seven TV, 7,000 GV uh, collisions. And I think the machine builders, Lynn Evans, and his uh, colleagues really deserved a big, uh, a big toast. Now, since then, the machine has been working uh, beautifully until 2012, when it was uh, stopped for maintenance. And actually, it has produced something like 2 times 10 to the 15 collisions. So I told you, Higgs won in two to the 10 to the 13. So Clearly, you already can think we should have seen the Higgs, and, and indeed we, we did. Uh, this high uh, performance of the machine also brought quite a few challenges, nice challenges, because when bunches crossed, not only a pair of protons interacted, but on, a, on average something like 20 pairs or so. So we had to find the interesting events in a very uh, complicated environment. You see, this is a, a bunch crossing, and, and many interactions happen, and only one, in this case, an event with a z decaying in mu plus, mu minus, uh, had to be found but out of all these uh, additional interactions. Now, I should also very briefly mention another element which had to be developed for uh, the LHC, namely, all the infrastructure to deal with so many interactions, so much in information and so on. And parallel to the machine and the experiments, one developed what is called the LHC computing grid. The LHC experiments, they produce something like 25 petabytes of data, which is really enormous, and if we would one can figure out how much this is by having a picture of if we will put this data on CD-ROMs without the covers, it would be a tower of more than 20 kilometers of CD-ROMs per year. So it's, it's a huge amount of data, and that can only be handled with a specifically developed system of uh, computers. It's a dynamic uh, network, in a way, a grid of computers, the data is collected at the CERN computer center, and then, uh, which is connected to some 12 very large uh, regional centers, and then more than 100 still large computer centers all over the world. And uh, in fact, one of these uh, large computer centers all over the world is also uh, here in uh, 
Slovenia. And in fact, the Slovenian physicist responsible for a, a very important fraction, actually, of the data uh, is uh, Borut Kesevan. So now I, after all this introduction, I will come to the physics. And of course, I will only give you a few, a few highlights, because the experiments have produced in these three years many, many results. And in fact, ATLAS and CMS together more than 700 uh, papers. And uh, you can see this is the, the papers over the years. So uh, there was a steady uh, production of uh, results. But all the results, they are publicly available uh, on, at CERN. So if you are interested in particular things, you can uh, find whether this has been measured or not at the LHC. So let me just show you a very, very few events, few examples. One uh, of the important measurements to start with is to measure already what is actually the probability that two protons hit each other. What is the cross-section, as we call it? And uh, you can see these are measurements which, which have been made very recently. And uh, just as a side remark, you can also see that actually going to high energy, this probability increases, the cross-section increases. This was somewhat known from cosmic ray uh, interactions already, but as you can see, this has of course been measured now with very high precision at the LHC. But remember, this is just any ordinary collision. The Higgs is much more uh, rare. Another thing which one was investigating immediately is, uh, well, can we reproduce known physics processes? And indeed, already in the first year, in 2010, for example, looking at uh, events where we have a mu plus, mu minus emerging and uh, looking at what, is, what mass would it correspond to this particle. One has reproduced a long history of particle physics with different resonances seen. So this is, for example, was a Nobel Prize, uh, well, in the 70s, the J Psi. This was the Z with a Nobel Prize in 1984 or so for Carlo Rubia and uh, Van der Meer. So clearly one sees immediately all these uh, uh, particles already uh, online. Now most of the uh, interactions when something violent happened is actually uh, due to the strong interaction. It's called quantum chromodynamics. For example, two quarks which hit each other and uh, which make a very, uh, very violent scattering. And the quarks, they are not visible as free particles. What they do is they fragment into stable particles, into sprays of stable particles and these sprays are called jets. And as you can see, some of these uh, collisions are really very violent because having uh, two protons each of three and a half TV, they have uh, produced a scattering where the mass of the scattering process, the energy, uh, would be something like 4.7 TV. So that will be a very, very heavy uh, particle. And again, we see that uh, they emerge opposite to each other because this is the phi separation and this is 180 degrees or so. So this production of uh, pro production probability of scattering of quarks and gluons actually has been measured, it's called the inclusive check cross-section, has been measured in previous accelerators, and that finally now also at uh, the LHC. And uh, these measurements can then be compared 
to quantum chromodynamic uh, calculations, as you can see, they, to produce very heavy massive objects like the one I said, up to 5 TV, this is of course many orders of magnitude, this is a highly logarithmic scale, less probable than lighter masses. Uh, one can ask oneself, do we, can we describe this with our theory of strong interaction? Well, yes, uh, but on this logarithmic scale you cannot see this very easily, so what one usually does is one looks at the ratio of the measurement to what the theory would have predicted here, uh, perturbative QCD theory, and if it is one, this ratio, then that means uh, one has described it well. There is a big interest in such comparison because it could be that after a certain uh, mass value, one would see a deviation from uh, this smooth description with QCD, and that would be somehow the equivalent what happened some hundred years ago with uh, Rutherford scattering. What this means is one looks in a, in, in a, it's again looking whether the quarks may be, there is some, something inside even, something more fundamental. Well, this seems not to be the case with our precision uh, so far. Then, a next uh, example of uh, physics we're looking at is electroweak physics, production of the W and the Z, for example here in mu plus mu minus, or a W which sometimes decays in the electron and the neutrino. Well, the, the muons, we have already seen, they leave traces through all the detector into the muon system. The electrons, well, they leave a trace, first a charge track inside and then an energy deposit of an electron in the electromagnetic calorimeter. The neutrino is special, it only makes weak interaction and there is not enough matter in the detector to see anything, so it appears as if the transverse energy, the transverse momentum is not balanced, something is missing here. And that's a typical signature for uh, neutrinos, we will come to that uh, on and on ag again. Oop. So, we have uh, hundreds of millions of these events and we can study actually the production of the Z resonance, for example, with very high precision and also very cleanly. You have to go to a logarithmic scale to see a background maybe of the order of 1% or so. And uh, just to make a historical flashback, <clears throat> Some 30 years ago, when we were working at the P bar P collider, we were very proud when we had three or eight of these set zeros. Now, we, as I said, we have hundreds of millions. And indeed, <clears throat> the, when we compare this with the theoretical calculations, which are the blue lines, uh, there is very good agreement and, uh, with the production of W's and Z's at 7 TV and also at 8 TV because in the later years then the latest year the LHC was running at 8 TV. That was at 600 uh, GV where the W and the Z were uh, discovered. Let me also show you <coughs> uh, another test that we understand the experiment by looking at the production of the heaviest of the elementary particle, which is the top quark. The top quark has a mass of about 175 GV. It was uh, discovered 1995 at Fermilab, at the machine which had a collision energy of 2 TV, and we have now measured with great precision this uh, top quark, top anti-top pair production, for example, 
at the LHC at 7 and 8 TV. These are just a few examples. There are many, many examples of known physics which we have uh, measured and compared with uh, the theory. In fact, here the gray boxes are the theoretical prediction and over many orders of magnitude you see that the measurement, which are the points with uh, colored uh, boxes, their uncertainties, they do agree. And, and in fact, measuring these standard model physics processes give us uh, a lot of confidence that the experiments are actually capable and ready to discover something new. And if we see something new, it's not just an artifact of the experiment. So we are ready now for the Higgs boson, and I will uh, just uh, as an intermezzo recall the very nice uh, happening in the 4th of July 2012 when the discovery was announced at CERN and in the media. It was announced simultaneously also at the conference, the biggest particle physics conference which happened at that time uh, in Australia. And that was again, the first, that was actually the first time when Francois England and Peter Higgs met. They were sitting here in the audience. So what is the evidence for the Higgs particle? Well, the Higgs particle can decay in different uh, ways. The simplest way is that it decays into two photons. The Higgs particle is a neutral particle, so it can get uh, two photons. And what we were looking with instruments which have a very good energy resolution we were looking at the uh, events which have such uh, two photons and uh, comparing the continuum of ordinary production of two photons with what we observe, namely we see an accumulation of such events at a given mass, 125 GV. This is shown here when taking the measurements and subtracting from it this uh, smooth curve. So you see a clear accumulation of events. Now, very importantly, in an independent experiment in CMS, exactly the same thing has been observed. Again, also at 125 GV. So clearly, in addition to the ordinary events producing two photons, there is another source, and uh, another source, a resonance. And that also, in order to see such a resonance, you need, of course, to measure the energies uh, very precisely. Otherwise, uh, the measurement errors would not allow to see really an accumulation of events. So that's one of the signatures. Another signature which uh, the Higgs particle, it can actually decay into two Z bosons. And as we already were saying, the Z boson, each one can decay into mu plus, mu minus, or E plus, E minus, for example. So one was looking at uh, the invariant mass of events where you have uh, four leptons in the final state as in this experiment, uh, in this picture here, where you have, for example, one C in two muons here, and one C in two muons on that side. And again, above the known sources, which are shown here in, in red of such uh, four lepton events, there was an accumulation showing up at 125 GV, again, in both experiments, in ATLAS here, and in CMS at that stage. There are much more other uh, decay channels, more difficult to analyze. It can, for example, also decay the Higgs in two Ws. The W1, for example, in electron neutrino, as I mentioned before. The other one, for example, in the muon and the neutrino. And 
the neutrinos, they don't interact, remember? So in this case, you have events where you would find electron, muons, and missing, well, missing momentum balance. And uh, you can nevertheless see that you have an accumulation of such events which correspond again to a mass of about 125 GeV. So, and there are even much more complicated uh, uh, decay channels. Now, how can we quantify? I think there's no doubt we have uh, discovered a new particle. How sure are we actually? Well, one can quantify this even by um, asking oneself the question, what is the probability that in all these mass distributions, they somehow conspire that they have a fluctuations of the background, of the measurement there is such that they accumulate all at 125 TV. So this uh, <coughs> probability, well, of course, in the beginning was not so small, then in 2002, on the 4th of July, it was about uh, one in uh, two millions or so. And uh, that, uh, okay, one started being very confident. By now, this is actually one in 10 to the 23. So clearly, uh, there is no doubt this is not a statistical fluctuations. Maybe another point I want to make is that one can uh, determine the mass of this resonance independently in the ATLAS experiment, in the CMS experiment, and you see that uh, it corresponds uh, within the measurement errors. Uh, this mass is, of course, the same. And there are other quantities one can look at, which I will now skip. Uh, well, are we sure it's the Higgs boson? What are the fingerprints of the Higgs boson? There are several, but there, is, there are two which are very important. Namely, the Higgs boson uh, interacts, the field, I should say, interact, the Higgs field interacts much stronger with the heavy particles. Remember, I mentioned this when talking about this uh, cartoon. And one can translate this into, we call this a coupling. If there is a strong coupling, it interacts more, and indeed, it interacts much more with uh, heavy particles like the WC or the top within these measurement errors than with light particles. Well, if one plots this appropriately, they should actually all fall on a straight line. Well, within large, errors, uh, they do that. The other thing is, I said that the spin should be zero, which is, is very unique. And uh, this has been also tested. And in fact, it has been tested by looking at uh, the, the way it decays, for example, in two photons, how are they oriented in the detector and so on. And there are slight differences if the particle would have a spin zero or if it would have a spin one or spin two. And uh, what one can say at this stage is that all these wrong spin assignments, they uh, have a very uh, low probability. They can be rejected with more than 99.7 or so percent probability. So it really looks like a Higgs particle, but uh, it could be just one of a family of Higgs, so the story is, of course, not finished yet. Let me show you how actually the data came in, and I take this four lepton channel. You see here the date, and that was the moment when we announced it in July, and then uh, the more data was taken until the end of the year, and uh, finally of course, there was no doubt that the peak was uh, building up. Okay, so now I will still take 
maybe five more minutes or so to say a little bit what beyond what comes beyond and uh, there are many many interesting things to look at at the LHC and in particular uh, one of the uh, beautiful theories which we would like really to find uh, evidence for it is called supersymmetry which makes in a way a mirror image of our known world of particles with a new world of particles which must be heavier because we haven't seen them yet which would bring a unification of fermion and bosons matter and force particles it would also solve some very deep problem in the standard model this was put forward uh, by Julius Wess and Bruno Zomino the really attractive thing of this uh, supersymmetry would be that it actually would give us a candidate for the dark matter because one of the, the biggest mysteries in physics and in, in physics in global is really the fact that already since the 30s, 1930 or so, the first time one has understood that the gravitationally uh, acting matter in the universe cannot be just what we see in the shining stars. It's not enough. In fact, there must be more matter which acts gravitationally, a factor uh, five or so more matter, but we don't see it. We see it indirectly. Uh, well, Zwick is saw it by making calculations how is it possible that clusters of galaxies stay together Vera Rubin calculated the speed of stars in the arms of spiral galaxies and again it, it needed about five times more matter in order to explain it than what was visible in the stars and in fact supersymmetry could provide such a candidate what happens in reactions where supersymmetric particle would be produced is well these supersymmetric particles they decay they make long decay chains into particles which we know from the standard model which we can measure but then at the end one always ends up with what is called the lightest supersymmetric particle, a neutral particle which escapes the detector. And so, uh, if we would find uh, such events where we have a lot of missing transverse energy, that could be a hint that we actually do see the production of supersymmetric particles. Now, we know that we have missing transverse energy because of the neutrinos in the standard model. So this would have to be in addition to what we see as missing transverse energy from the standard model, even more than, than that. And so one looks in distributions where one would, uh, one examines distributions with essentially missing transverse energy is another variable here but related to it and one sees whether there is an excess what has this to do with, with dark matter well the idea is that <clears throat> at the uh, shortly after the big bang 10 to the minus 10 second after the big bang maybe the energies were such that a lot of such supersymmetric particles have been produced and uh, then the universe cooled down and since then, since this 10 to the minus uh, 10 second, this matter has uh, been accumulated uh, and has also formed and accumulated near the galaxies and so. So that, that's the, the basic thing behind it. Now let me tell you that we have looked at many such distributions and we have not found any excess. So what this means is we can just put limits, for example, 
limits on the production of the supersymmetric partner of the gluon, of the uh, gluon which are called gluinos, or the supersymmetric partner of the quarks, which are called quarks, they must be heavier than 1.7 TV, otherwise we would have seen them. Many, many such uh, searches have been made, and this colored bar, they all show uh, the regions which we can exclude, but we may still find supersymmetric uh, models to be correct if the masses are higher than that. Another thing we can look at is uh, looking at heavier particles than, for example, the Z. If we look in E plus E minus uh, pairs, well, now on a very large mass scale, we see at 92 GV the famous uh, Z0, which we all know. But if, for example, there will be a Z prime at 1.5 or 2.5 TV, we should this amount of uh, events here. The black points are the data, so we don't see them. A again, this can be translated into uh, limits and uh, these limits, this is the experimental limit, and we can compare that, for example, to what hypothetical uh, theories predict, what the probability, the cross-section should be. Just the example which I've taken here, the very famous example is for uh, gravitons, which are a spin-2 particle, in a theory for which uh, extra dimensions by Lisa Randall and uh, Sundrum, who is here, uh, visiting the Atlas uh, control room. So the, the, the meaning of such plots, just to explain you, is that this is the experimental limit. This is what is predicted. So in this theory, clearly, if there would have been a 2 TV graviton, we should have seen it. We didn't see it. So we can put a limit here at 2.7 or so TV. If it's 3 TV, clearly our limit would not be strong enough uh, to exclude it. And that's the way many such hypotheses are, are uh, looked for. And just to give you an idea, many, we call this exotic uh, theories are tested and the, again, the bars tell you that, well, we exclude dark matter, we exclude leptoquarks, objects which have been put forward in a hypothetical uh, series. I come to the end. <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, we have had certainly a very uh, exciting first phase of the LHC, but we have only accumulated about 1% of the number of collisions which are foreseen for the whole lifetime of the experiment. So there can be still a lot coming. Furthermore, uh, during this shutdown here, we have actually improved the machine to be sure that no incident like in 208 uh, could happen so that we can go to the full energy because we have been taking data at 7 and 8 TV, but the design of the machine is really 14 TV. And again, if you have more energy, of course, you can make higher mass particles. So uh, uh, there's a lot, not only much more collisions, also higher energy. So the potential is still very, very large of this machine. And I would like to end by saying that, okay, we only just started our uh, journey into new physics. I think there are still a lot of exciting times ahead of us. It's, uh, by the way, also interesting to note that the LHC has been really on our mind for half of the lifetime of CERN. So there's CERN's 60th anniversary. Okay, so thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Peter. I think we have time for a few questions. Please. Okay, Peter, maybe I can ask you uh, just, just to start. <coughs> um, well, uh, the, the Higgs boson was very close to the results obtained at LEP. So some people at LEP were very disappointed that uh, it's, it was lying just behind the corner. But, uh, well, can you comment this? I mean, we, I, I, I can just say that we could not push LEP further. In well, it would would not have been, it, it was not far away from the maximum energy one could actually uh, get to with lab. However, the, uh, the problem in electron-positron colliders mm -hmm. with, with electrons to keep them on, on a round track is that they make a lot of synchrotron radiation and uh, one has to pump in enormous amount of energy uh, to keep them on their energy. And uh, really, it would have been not possible, really, to push the lab machine. I mean, they were, one would have to have much more space to put accelerating cavities, yeah. and the energy <laughs> would have been, the energy which one would have to pump in would have been very, very high. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that uh, the, the number of events would have been very low. Maybe it would have been possible if one could have pushed the lab energy, and I should say the lab limit was 115 GV. That's really where, where it stopped. And okay, the Higgs is at 125. So it's, it sounds like a small, small uh, gap, but it's in, in terms of energy, it would have been a huge gap. Also, there would have been only it would have been good for a discovery, but not really good for a, uh, a study in detail because very, very few events would have been built. However, uh, if one collides electron and positrons, one has, of course, a much cleaner situation than if one collides protons on protons. As I said, there's a lot of debris. It's, uh, the protons are not the elementary uh, constituents. And therefore, one is envisaging uh, electron-positron colliding machines, maybe to study in great detail uh, the Higgs <laughs> particle. But one would do this quite likely in uh, machines which are linear colliders, where one avoids this huge loss of the synchrotron radiation. So that's uh, one aspect. However, there are also now ideas maybe to, to build a, a much bigger ring for doing E plus E minus uh, collisions and, and studies. To, to sit the on the Higgs, you mean? To sit on the Higgs with the... Uh, Sorry? E, to sit on the Higgs with the E plus E minus yeah. machine and that, do that's, spectroscopy. Uh, that, this is a consideration which is also uh, uh, done. No, but LEP anyhow was pushed up to the limit yeah. al already. Lab, lab already. The lab in the 27 kilometer tunnel, it would not have But still, some possible. people believe that it was a political decision. No, know, it was not. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? You said you are testing extra dimensions. Is this, is this uh, by looking to the uh, creation of micro black holes or uh... yeah so one that's uh, one of the things one is also looking at I, I, I have uh, skipped that uh, let me show you maybe that's an example which I could make uh, <coughs> in fact one of the possibilities to look at to, to, that extra dimensions would uh, turn up is in uh, is by the production of microscopic black holes. And these microscopic black holes, they immediately uh, make uh, Hawking's, Stephen Hawking radiation. 
And the one of the ways they would be uh, turned visible in the experiment is that in the evaporation process of these <clears throat> black holes, actually leptons, photons, quarks are produced in a quite a democratic way. So you would have events which have uh, a lot of such objects, leptons, photons, That's quarks. And you do find uh, real events which have a lot of jets, which have a lot of uh, such objects. However, uh, if one looks at the distribution of such events, again, they are, first of all, uh, it's a very smooth distribution and they can be described by the tail of normal standard model processes. Uh, what is shown here in this example is what you would actually expect for black holes, for example, between 4 and 5.5 TV uh, black holes. So you would expect in the tail uh, such events and uh, they have not been seen. So again, the same story one then uh, can uh, build <coughs> um, well, upper limits as I mentioned here, typically four or five uh, TV objects or so. They must be heavier than that uh, if they exist really. Yes, there is a question. Wait for the microphone. How much energy does this facility consume? Excuse How much electricity does this consume? How much ex electricity? Well, it's a superconducting machine, so actually the, the most of the, the energy consumption is not in accelerating the beam or so. It's, it's in the cryogenics to keep the, the, uh, the machine cold. Uh, it, it's about the same consumption as a, a city of 100,000 uh, inhabitants, to give you a picture. That's the whole CERN, but it's, it's dominated by, by the LHC operation. Yes. One probably stupid question. It's very hard for me to understand all this theory about Higgs boson. But basically, the Higgs boson is responsible for the mass of matter. Yeah. Well, let, it, it is, one should not say it this way. The, the Higgs boson is a manifestation that there is a Higgs field. And it's really or the proud Engler Higgs field, to be correct, because uh, these all gentlemen uh, deserve the credit. And uh, the, the, the Higgs boson is an excitation of that field, and thereby, as we have seen it, a verification that this field actually exists. But it, it's, uh, it's not the Higgs boson which gives directly uh, the mass, it's, it's the interaction of the particles with the Routinglet Higgs field. Well, the way I'm thinking, the space is full of matter with mass. So it has to be full of these Higgs bosons. Of the field. The field, yes. The field is everywhere. Yes. Yes. So why it's so difficult to uh, detect this field? Well, because you have to to wiggle it, so to speak, to excite it. And we did not have uh, enough energy, really, to make it a local, locally such that it uh, builds and manifests itself as uh, this resonance. You need a lot of uh, energy to excite it sufficiently that uh, you create uh, for a short while, uh, what we call the Higgs boson. You yes. have competing processes which are more probable than this one, and th well, that's yeah, why you and don't then see. Then you it. have all, all yeah. this uh, normal, strong interaction between uh, between the quarks and gluons, which you collide after all. Okay, thank you. If uh, well, I don't see any more hands. 
So if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you, Peter, again for the excellent lecture and the beautiful insight into the Higgs boson and beyond the standard model physics. And I think the take away or take home message for the young people is that basic science is uh, very difficult. It takes a long time to prepare the experiments to, from the idea, you, you have seen that from the idea to the realization of the experiments at LHC is uh, three decades, 30 years. We all get gray in that time. And, but uh, anyhow, science is also very rewarding. Thank you very much again, Peter. Thank you.